Hello, English 46A students. I want to try to do a quick uh, video um, regarding some of the sonnets that we're reading. And um, I want to start with one of Spencer's. And so if you looked at Spencer's Amoretti, I asked you to read oh, about, what, 10, 10 of the uh, sonnets. You can see that the language of that Spencer is using um, is closer to the Middle English. And um, it's more antiquated spelling. And I wish they'd given you a little bit more guidance on some of it. Uh, in Sonnet 37, what guile is this? G-U-Y-L-E is meant to be recognized as G-U-I-L-E, the modern English word for guile, a trick, a game, a deception. Okay. Um, I, you know, I have to admit, I, I tend to take it in stride because I'm used to the Chaucer and things like that. Um, but it could be a little easier. Um, but I do think most of it can be figured out. You, um, in that sense, it's not meant to make it harder on you. It's meant, you know, not, not modernizing the language is meant to put us in touch with the reality of things. Um, hearing that can sometimes work better because then you're not focused on a specific letter. Instead, you're hearing um, the actual sonnets. Uh, a lot of these sonnets are out there on YouTube in various forms uh, also. Okay, I just want to go over a couple of them really quickly. Let's look at number 65. And again, as I said with the Sydney poem and the Campion and other poems in these video lectures, um, looking at the grammar, following sentence structure, sentence by sentence by sentence, thinking about a performance, somebody actually speaking to you, and therefore a, a person that might have a specific point of view, uh, specific ideas, specific feelings that they would want to be conveying. And again, we have to figure out, are they talking directly to a, a specific person, the beloved perchance? Or are they speaking sort of aloud to themselves, thinking through a problem, a concern, um, a set of feelings, that sort of thing. If you look at number 65, I'm going to read it and then I'm going to walk through it. Um, the key thing there is this bird in a cage, the gentle bird. Now remember, um, I, I do believe that Spencer is writing these amoretti, these little loves, in honor of his relationship with um, his second wife. His first wife had died, and he um, apparently fell in love uh, with a woman, married her, and is quite happy in that relationship. And he wrote the, the poems to celebrate that. Sonnet 65. Let me, let me read it aloud and then walk back through it. The doubt which ye misdeem, fair love, is vain, that fondly fear to lose your liberty when loosing one to liberties ye gain, and make him bond that bondage erst did fly. Sweet be the bands the which true love doth tie without constraint or dread of any ill. The gentle bird feels no captivity within her cage, but sings and feeds her fill. Their pride dare not approach, nor discord spill. The league betwixt them. Their pride dare not approach, nor discord spill. The league betwixt them, that loyal love hath bound. The simple truth and mutual good will seeks with sweet peace to salve each other's wound. There faith doth fearless dwell in brazen tower, and spotless pleasure builds her sacred bower. Okay, now it helps if you look at the, you know, um, the guiding um, glosses. Misdeem, misconceive, fondly, foolishly, make him bond, bound, that bondage erst, formally, we might say first, um, did fly. Spill means destroy. And faith in the very end means fidelity. And, you know, we talk about people being faithful if they've um, 
been acting with fidelity in a, in a relationship. Okay, so this is a poem about an anxiety about, say, bondage, that is the marriage bond, <laughs> and the idea that actually it is, is, it's a positive thing for both because um, you're then bound together. It might seem like a cage, but it's more like the bird cage, which protects the bird, and there the bird thrives. Or it's like a tower of brass, brazen tower. It's like a sacred bower, a garden of bliss by which the two can come. So it's, it, this is a poem about anxiety about, about marriage and meant to be reassuring. The doubt which ye, you, the doubt which ye misdeem, fair love, is vain that fondly fear to lose your liberty. Okay, so the anxiety that you feel is, 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 is misplaced, dearest one, fair love, um, for, you, you know, you're not really losing your liberty, you're going to gain. Okay, now, side note. Critics of the institution of marriage Historians who would look and see how the wife is in a subservient, um, frankly, subservient position legally to a husband might actually want to argue that, you know, he's speaking from male privilege here. Um, that may be so. I also think this is meant to be a reassuring, loving poem in which he is not going to be a tyrant, but together they will be in that, that lovely cage, in that tower of brass, in that sacred bower of bliss. Okay? I think that's all I'm going to say about that one. All right, let's go to the next one, 65, 67. Okay. We've had lots of hunting poems. This is a hunting poem. We've had deer, women as deer poems. Uh, in a couple different ones. And here's another, number 67. And there is a note that it's an imitation. Aha, the note reminds us this, right? It's an imitation of Petrarch's uh, Rima 190, but with a very different ending compared to Thomas Wyatt's adaptation, who so lists to hunt, etc. Okay, so this is meant to put us there in the same way. Now let me double check any other notes. Next means nearby. Assay means an attempt. That's where our word essay and essay is an attempt to explain something. Uh, beguiled, we might, beguiled, we might say beguiled, tricked. It's deluded. Okay. Sonnet 67 by Edmund Spencer. Like as a huntsman after weary chase, seeing the game from him escaped away, sits down to rest him in some shady place with pounting, panting hounds beguiled of their prey. So, after long pursuit and vain essay, when I, all weary, had the chase forsook, the gentle deer returned the self-same way, thinking to quench her thirst at the next brook. There she, beholding me with milder look, sought not to fly, but fearless still did bide, till I in hand her yet half-trembling took, and with her own good will, her formally tied. Strange thing me seemed to see a beast so wild, so goodly one, with her own will beguiled. Okay, the huntsman fails in the chase and has to take a rest, so he too, chasing his beloved, the woman he's after. He tries and he tries, and I guess his courtship's not working, so he pauses and rests. And there the gentle deer, the sweet beloved one, approaches him and mildly accepts being tied marriage. It's meant to be, it's, it's meant to be a very literary poem in which um, the audience, the educated audience of Spencer's time would have thought of Wyatt's poem, would have thought of Petrarch's poem, whether in translation perhaps in the Italian. These were uh, quite learned um, men and some women 
in this in this coterie and um and there you have it this idea that and what i like what i find sweet okay let's let me just put this right what i find sweet in this sonnet is is to me a convincing appreciation and wonder that he was so lucky okay okay let's do number 75 then sonnet 75 quite famous other poets will imitate this and i do think this is not a an uncommon idea of someone writing the name like i love you in the sand at the beach and the wave comes and washes it away okay and the beloved here is going to say well hey you're being foolish to even try that okay let's look closely one day i wrote her name upon the strand but came the waves and washed it away again i wrote it with a second hand but came the tide and made my pains his prey vain man said she that dost in vain assay a mortal thing so to immortalize for i myself shall like to this decay and eke my name be wiped out likewise not so quoth i let baser things devise to die in dust but you shall live by fame my verse your virtues rare shall eternize and in the heavens write your glorious name or when as death shall all the world subdue, our love shall live and later life renew. So we have a dramatic situation um, presented to us in which a man and his beloved are walking by the seashore. And he goes to put her name in the sand, writing in the sand, and it gets washed away. And so he tries it again and doesn't work. And she's like, oh, you're foolish. I'm a mere mortal thing. You can't immortalize me with your words. And he says yes i can and then we get to that that argument of i'm going to write a poem so good celebrating you and our love that people will be reading it forever and that will be your you will be eternal through that shakespeare is going to do make the same claim uh the tone's a little different in the shakespeare sonnet i'll get to that another day uh, but here again i find a certain appreciation and sort of wonder that uh, Spencer is as, as sort of lucky as he is to have this particular beloved, and he wants to do his best to celebrate her. Um, not everybody reads them the same way. Um, I'm looking, I'm looking for that voice, and I'm encouraging that. I'm looking for that specific voice that you know. And I could point to different things within the whole dozen or so sonnets I asked you to read uh, to try to, um, to to back that up. I mean, I could imagine an essay topic. In this regard, we're trying to put together a certain um, voice that I hear. Um, but a warning, if you try to do this with the, the Shakespeare sonnets, you might have a harder time because Shakespeare in his sonnets goes all over the place. And some of them are written to a young man. Some of them are written to a, a, a dark haired lady. Some of them are written to himself. Some are written to the muse. And he goes, and Shakespeare goes through many different emotions. And that's part of the, uh, the, the wonder and the craft and the charm that Shakespeare brings to his sonnet cycle. They might seem like similar poems, all these 14 liners. Uh, and some of them are. They just flat out are because, you know, they're imitating each other. They're just, you know, uh, particularly in Shakespeare, he's like, okay, I'm going to try this same theme one more time. And then I'll try it again. Okay, so again, um, the audience did not mind. Okay, so that was three by Spencer and a few comments about sonnets in general um, there at the end. Okay, hope you're all well.